How many people know that we're called to light the way for Jesus? Amen. Amen. How many of you guys came expecting a word from God today? Some of you guys came routing that praise and worship, huh? Yeah. Let's make some noise for God one more time in this place. It's okay to get excited about God, isn't it? We can get excited about a lot of things in this world. I believe that God should be the thing that we're most excited about. I know some of you guys are going to get excited after church about some football games. I won't be because my Cowboys aren't there. But I'm believing the best for next year, amen? There's always next year. Story of my life. <laughs> amen. But how many of you guys came expecting a word from God today? Truly, I love, I, I love starting off almost every service with it because I, I want to get it fresh inside of you. Because I believe that God is always moving. The question is, are we seeing God move? And I believe that no matter who's preaching or what the sermon's about or what you're reading, what passage or portion of scripture, if you start it off with say, God, speak to me. God, I'm expecting to see you. How many people know that you're going to see God move? Because most of the time, I would say every time, God is already moving. And a lot of times we say, God, I haven't seen you move. Does that mean that God hasn't been moving? It just means that we haven't seen him move. So one of the prayers is, God, open up my eyes that I could see you. Open up my heart that I could feel you. Open up my mind that I could think about you. Open up my mouth that I could speak what you want me to speak. That spirit of expectation. And I believe whenever we come expecting a word from God, I believe one word can change your entire life. I believe one decision, some of you guys are one decision away from the biggest breakthrough in your life. But some people are one decision away from making the biggest mistake of their life. One decision this way, one decision that way. And one word from God can determine which way you go. How many people know that God is calling you to get closer to him? Amen. God wants you closer to him. And I believe when we open up this thing. We're saying, God, we want to see you move in this place. God, we're expecting you to move. God, I don't want a word. I need a word. Have you ever been there before, church? I need a word from you, God. I don't want a word. Yeah, I want a word. But it's past that. I need a word from you to move forward. So that's our prayer. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for this day. Packed out house two times, God. And I pray that you would. Do it all over again. If you did it before, you could do it again. I pray that you would move heavily in this place, fresh anointing in this place. The enemy has no power in this place, God. Pray against every distraction or anything that would hinder the word of God from coming forth in the way that you've already designed it, pre-planned it. So I pray for an anointing over this word. Prepare our hearts and our minds to be able to receive it and that real and true life change would happen collectively here centered around and focused around your word and saying that Jesus you're the only reason why we showed up you take this stage we'll preach your word in Jesus name amen come on guys let's make some noise one more time for Jesus amen so we are in our vision series and we are wrapping it up our anchor verse is Proverbs 29 18 it's probably one of the most famous passages in the Bible about vision uh, Proverbs 29, 18, the word of the Lord reads, where there is no vision, the people perish. There is this, uh, this quote, I, I'm not sure where it originated from, but I believe it to be true um, and really impacting the word of God or uh, showing that the word of God is true. And it goes like this, a man without a vision is a man without a future. A man without a future will always revert to his past. How many people know that's true? I think a lot of people in here could raise their hand and say, that's been my life for the last decade, for the last 20 years, for the last 30 years. And really, that's what's going to happen. Because how many people know it's easier to go backwards than it is to go forward? Have you ever dro drove out of town or dr driven out of town? I remember sometimes when we go to South Padre Island, the, the drive is grueling. It takes forever. It feels like we're never going to get there. Have you ever been somewhere and you stay a few days, but then whenever you come home, the drive home always seems quicker? Because it's easier to go back than it is to go forward. And it's the same thing with God. How many people know it's difficult to follow God sometimes? But it's easy to go back to your old ways. It's easy to sedate your problems, to drown your problems, to drown your misery than it is to follow God in an uncomfortable season of your life. How many people know that? You want to preach with me today? 
And I believe that. I believe that whenever God gives us a vision, future, a hope, that's what keeps us going forward in the midst of adversity. Uh, You think about coronavirus, COVID, that's what kept us going forward when so many things were shutting down, when uh, organizations and nonprofits, for us to be able to go forward with the men's home, 50, 60 guys inside of a men's home and not able to fundraise, but we can only depend on God. And what we believe is where there is vision, there is provision. And if we keep preaching this gospel and saying that this God is going to provide, guess what happens? God shows up every single time and he provides in this season and the next, in COVID-19 and in COVID-20 or whatever else the world wants to throw at us, I believe in the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He's still here. He still rules. He still reigns. How many of you guys believe that today? Amen. So we are in week three of this series. Week one was reach the lost. We talked about when Jesus, uh, with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, that Jesus went out of his way for somebody else. How many people know that if we're really going to reach the lost, we're going to have to get outside of ourselves and go somewhere where other people won't, to reach somebody that other people won't, and to get to a Samaritan woman, not just a woman. Jews wouldn't, uh, wouldn't even talk to women in public, let alone a Samaritan woman. They were despised. But yet Jesus really didn't care about the rules. Amen? You're like, that's my Jesus. I don't care about the rules either. Bunch of rebellious people. But he was willing to associate with someone who others aren't. And that's the kind of church I want to be. I want to be a church that has uh, people in it that all don't look the same. I don't want everybody to look like me in this church. Matter of fact, if you showed up to a church and everybody looks exactly the same, that's not the place I want to be. Instead of saying something bad, I'm just going to say, that's just not where I want to be. (laughs) And then Jesus goes to the well. He finds a need and fills it. He finds a hurt and heals it. And I believe that if we're going to be that kind of church, since this is a vision series and what kind of church we're going to be, we're not going to push the drug addict away or the alcoholic away or those who are going through a divorce or bankrupt or who just lost their house or lost their job. We're not pushing them away. I'm looking for them and trying to pull them in. That's where we start. That's not where we end. And I believe that that's the heart of Jesus. And then week two, we talked about making disciples. And we learned that believing in Jesus is something different than following Jesus. Amen? That we can all believe in Jesus. There's a historical Jesus. Yeah, he was real 2,000 years ago. But it's one thing to believe in him, and it's another thing to follow him through the thick and thin of life tragedies, the triumphs, the mountaintop, the valleys, that you're still going to go wherever Jesus tells you to go. We talked about when Jesus says you have to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow him. And I had to make the distinction or, or I wanted to bring it to your mind to let you know about the cross because it's a little something different what we think about a cross today than 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago when they thought about a cross, they think it was a device for execution. People would be crucified on a cross. 2,000 years ago, if you would have set a cross, people would have thought of the most horrific, embarrassing way to die. Stripped naked. And you were told that you were going to have to carry the cross. You weren't just sentenced to death. A part of your sentence was that you had to carry your own cross to your own death. So think about that. When Jesus says to deny yourself, carry your cross, and follow him, That doesn't mean like, oh, I'm going to fast every now and then and, you know, I'm going to read my Bible plan because that's what real Christians do. I'm just playing. I'm playing. Sorry, guys. I had to. But what Jesus was saying, would you be willing to carry your cross unto death for me? And he didn't end there. He started there. He started off the altar call. Who is willing to die for me? And I believe that that's the kind of church that God is calling us to be. But Jesus so radically changed the idea of a cross that it was a thing of execution, um, something that you thought of pain, embarrassment, torture, to now today that whenever we think about the cross, we think about forgiveness. When we think about the cross, we think about love. When we think about the cross, we think about somebody who went first and changed it. And I was saying today, we even have people who wear we wear crosses on our necklaces. And to put it in perspective, it was, an, it was a device to be executed. Can you imagine a, an electric chair on the end of your necklace? 
That's what a cross is. I had some people come up to me after church and they were saying, so is it bad for me to wear a cross? And it wasn't just one person, so don't feel bad. It was multiple people. They're like, am I not supposed to wear a cross? I'm like, no, it's okay to wear a cross. It's a story of what Jesus did, how he could take something so ugly, so uh, disgusting, something so brutal, and turn it into something like love, something like for forgiveness. Only Jesus could do something like that. And now we are in week three. The title of week three is Lead the World. Now, I want to tell you about whenever I say lead the world, some people say, well, we're not supposed to really care about the world. We're not of the world. So why should we care about the world? But what did Jesus, what did God say? For God so loved the that he gave his only son. Now, I'm not saying be in the world or be influenced by the world. What I'm saying is lead the world. What I believe is that the church should be leading the world instead of the other way around. I believe the world should be coming to the church for advice. The world should be coming to the church for counsel instead of the other way around. I believe that we have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us, and we should wave the banner, hold the torch, and we should be the leaders in this world. And right now, more than ever, especially what we are going through, we need people who would be sent out to lead this world, filled with the power of God. How many people are on board with me today? So, in the idea and the mindset of leading the world, one thing I've learned about leadership, and that's before you can lead anyone else, you first have to learn how to lead yourself. How many people know the hardest person on the planet for you and I to lead is yourself? You can give counsel to anybody and everybody, and they'll listen to you. But you give counsel to yourself, you'll argue with yourself. (laughs) Crazy. Yes, we are crazy. (laughs) We can give marriage advice and save a couple. Go home and argue. (laughs) Other people, we don't. We don't. (laughs) Ever. <laughs> but we would give people financial advice and not take it ourselves. We could tell people that they're no good for you, but yet you keep people around you that are no good for you. You know what I mean? So one of the biggest and greatest struggles that we're all going to have, everybody here, including myself, is leading ourselves. But if you truly want to be a leader that God is calling you to be, you want to lead yourself. Some of you are like, well, I'm not going to be a leader. The moment you get married, men, guess what? You're supposed to be a leader. Key word, supposed, supposed to be. Three words. Key words, supposed to be. <laughs> Moms, leading your kids, parents, raising up your children. How many people know that your first disciples are your kids? And before we can disciple the world, we first have to disciple our home. I believe the best way for us to lead is by reflecting Christ, though. How many people agree? It's our job is to reflect the love of God in my life. When when you see my life, I want you to see Christ. Is that what y'all want? When 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 somebody sees my life, I want them to be inspired about change and see how somebody could get through something. And they're like, you know what? I want that God. Whatever God, whatever happened in his life, that's what I want. And I say it's Jesus. Well, then I want Jesus. And I believe that that's what what happened whenever we're holding the torch. We're allowing people to see the Jesus inside of us. But if there's anything that I feel like you're going to take away that could absolutely impact your life, it's this next part. That our job is to reflect Christ, not project ourselves. Reflect, don't project. Everybody say reflect, don't project. Say reflect, don't project. So I I asked God for an illustration whenever I was in my prayer chambers as I pray 14 hours a day in my closet. I only come out to preach and feed my family. No, I'm kidding. I was was asking God because if there's anything I wish I could have learned a long time ago, I've been doing this for 10 years now. If there's something that I wish I would have learned, I wish I would have learned this a long time ago so you guys can start with this. I asked God, I was, I was thinking about this idea of projecting because um, I, I've learned about projecting and how it can negatively or positively impact your leadership. And so the idea of what I got, I, I saw the moon one night. H- have you ever seen the moon, how bright it is in a dark night? And it's crazy how in a dark night, something like that can light up the whole entire night. 
You can see because of the moonlight. But on a clear night, whenever you take a picture or you just look very carefully, you can see some dark images on that moon, can you not? It's been through some damage, right? It's been through some things. The moon has a testimony. I've been hit by craters. I've been hit by a spaceship. I'm just like. So when you see the moon, can you see damage? But are you affected by the damage? But are you positively impacted by the light? Even though the moon has been damaged, it's still going to reflect the sun. And it's not saying just because I've been through some things that I'm not going to reflect the sun. I know I've been through some things. I know I've been damaged. But what has happened in the past is not going to stop me from reflecting the sun because that's my job. That's what I'm here to do. And so I'm thinking in my mind, can we not take a leadership lesson from the moon? Because how many people have been through some things in their life? Say amen. amen. I think we've all been through some things in our life. And, and you could say, well, I've been damaged. I've been hit. I've been hurt. I've been through some things in my life. And I get it. And not everybody knows what you've been through. But how many people know that God does? God knows what you've been through. I'm not saying it was okay, but God can still use everything that you've ever been through in your life. Every pain, every heartache, every tear, every bad experience God can use and still get glory out of. And I know I've been through some things, but I'm still going to reflect the Son of God in my life. I, I was thinking about projecting, and, and, and I wish I would have had this illustration a long time ago because I never truly, it said, don't project on people. And I never really understood it until I thought about a projector. You see the screen here? It's a nice screen, right? It's a screen just hanging out on the wall. It's got a friend over there. And guess what is awesome about this screen? It doesn't need anybody else to help it decide what it is. Matter of fact, when the, when, when the, team, when the media team got here this morning, there was nothing on that screen, right? That screen is a screen all by itself. But you see this projector right here? This little knucklehead right here. What they're doing in the back from that computer is sending a signal into this projector. And now what is inside of this projector is going through the lens. And what's on the inside of this projector, we now see on the screen. So now we can't see the screen for what it really is. We see the screen through the lens of this projector. How many people know that there are some things inside of you? And there are people that are just like this screen. They are good with or without you. They know who they are. They know who they're supposed to be. But by the way that we see them is what is on inside of us. The way that you see, the way that you see yourself is usually the way you see somebody else. So how many people know that what you don't like in other people is usually what you don't like in yourself? Because we see an image that is cast over this screen, but this image is coming from inside of this projector. And there's a lot of times that we don't like something in somebody, but really what it is is something that we don't like inside of ourselves. The Bible says before you take the speck out of somebody else's eye, you need to take the plank out of your own eye. I never really caught it, but both of these things are wood. Because what you see in yourself is usually what you see in other people. In other words, God was saying, take care of yourself before you try to take care of somebody else. And if we don't heal, how many people know that you're going to continue to hurt everybody around you? And if you're not happy, happy with yourself, you'll never be happy with anyone around you. Nobody, ever, no matter what. And then I'm like, maybe that's what it was whenever Jesus was speaking to the woman at the well. When he goes, go get your husband. And she's like, I'm not married. He goes, oh, yeah, you're right. And matter of fact, or the guy that you're with is not your husband, and you've been married five times. I don't think Jesus was just trying to put her on blast like that. <laughs> but he was trying to bring something out, especially to the readers, I believe. That if you don't heal from what you go through in this relationship, you're going to take the pain into your next relationship. And you're going to be arguing with the person right in front of you, but really who you're arguing with this person that you left a long time ago. There's this quote, it says, if you don't heal from what hurt you, you'll bleed on people who didn't harm you. 
until you heal on the inside of you, you'll end up hurting everybody around you. That's why we say hurt people hurt people, but we also say change people, change people. And it's not that somebody has the absolute ability to change somebody else, but whenever you change yourself, you could become an example for somebody else to see how to do it, an example on how to follow Jesus. I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I'm saying I'm changing on the inside of me. I believe in a God that will allow me to change because my God stays the same yesterday, today, and forever, so I know what to change into. So before we can ever lead anybody else, the first thing that we have to do is lead ourselves. And then the next one is lead with compassion. We need to lead with compassion. And everybody knows that it's true here. Every single person knows that we should lead with compassion. But to be totally honest with you, I was hesitant on using this word compassion. Because sometimes I feel like it's overused and thrown around a lot. Like especially with commercials. If you have compassion, you can help these animals. <laughs> For $19.99 a month, you can help Cujo get a house. <laughs> and, then, and then it feels like if you don't give, you're not a person who has compassion, right? But then the very next commercial is a family that's looking like this. Hunger affects one out of four people in America. And for $19.99 a month, you can feed a family. I'm like, so who do I feed, the dog or the family? You know what I also thought? Is, I didn't say this in the first service, but how do we, how do we have, don't take offense to this, but how do, we, how do we have a country that leads the entire world in obesity, and still has people starving. I'm just saying, I'm not saying that you are, you're not, you're bad or not. What I'm saying is that we got to change some things. Because I don't want to lead out of guilt tripping somebody like, oh, what if you don't, if you don't help me, then, then, then you don't have compassion. That's not, the, that's not the type of leadership or the kind of church that I want. Can you imagine a, a children's church commercial? All the kids are like this. And it's a black and white video, and they're playing some soft keys in the background. By the summer of 2021, Rise Kids will have no volunteers to teach them. <laughs> You're like, oh. <laughs> and all you would have to do is donate one hour out of 168 hours a week to help somebody. <laughs> to be a role model to somebody who doesn't have a father. To be a role model. That's guilt tripping, right? That was pretty good too, right? But you know what? I would rather raise up a church that can see the political environment and the spiritual climate and realize we're in a godless society, a godless education and say, you know what? I might not be great at it, but I'm going to get good at it. I'm going to teach these kids about a living God. I want to do something about it to lead with the inspiration and not, not guilt tripping, but true compassion because I believe that's the way that Jesus wants us to lead. Matthew 9:36. The word of the Lord reads, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Now, this word moved in the original Greek, it, it carries a little bit more weight. I think sometimes whenever we translate from the Greek to the English, a lot of times they have to like water it down a little bit, uh, not to take it out of context, but our Western eyes especially, we don't like graphic stuff. And so... They'll change a lot of this stuff. If you don't know that, me and Z were just talking about that. A lot of the Old Testament words are kind of, I don't know, sugar-coated a little bit. But this word moved. Whenever you think about it, when Jesus, he saw people that were scattered and that he was moved. This word moved in the original, it literally means intestines, your bowels, and your kidneys. And then you think about why would they have used that word to say that Jesus was moved, his insides. But have you ever seen something that you were so upset with that you could feel it in your stomach? And it's trying to depict this imagery that Jesus saw these people who were scattered and he was so upset that it hurt his stomach. And church, what I believe is that whenever you see something 
and it moves you to your core. When it moves you to the inside of who you are, you are getting bits and pieces, clues of your calling and your purpose in your life. I want you to think about it. Jesus was a shepherd, and so it upset him to see sheep that were scattered. You know that word scattered, it literally means abandoned, neglected. He's a shepherd, not just any shepherd, but the good shepherd, the shepherd. And he sees his people that are neglected, abandoned, harassed, thrown down. It would move somebody. It's kind of like out here in West Texas. Have you ever seen a, uh, a bull or a cow outside of a fence line? And all his buddies are over here on the inside? And he doesn't even know how he got out? <laughs> He's like, I'm going to go ahead and go, though. <laughs> To us, it may not make a whole lot of sense, or we might not care, but to a rancher or somebody, a, a herdsman or somebody who lives in that world, it would probably affect them a little different, like that animal is going to get hurt if somebody doesn't fix it. It's the same thing whenever Jesus, he would see his sheep that were scattered deep down on the inside of him. He knows that he can do something about it. It creates that pain, church. What I want to tell you is God wants to use the pain for fuel and the passion to move you forward in your calling. Because I believe that a lot of us have pain in our lives. Would y'all agree? How many people have made some mistakes in your life that have caused pain? <laughs> All the hands go up, right? How many people have made some mistakes in their life that you wish that you could take back? I think we all have mistakes that I wish, you know, whenever I think about my parents, I think about how many countless sleepless nights my parents had to go through. Wondering. Am I going to be alive? Is this the phone call? Is this the police? Or is this the hospital saying that my son's dead because of the mistakes that I used to make whenever I was a kid? But how many people know that you can't go backwards? You can't change anything going backwards, but I can change the way the things end. I can change the future. And do you know what happens, what stirs up on the inside of me whenever I see a mom and a dad out here and I see the same face that my parents used to make because their son's on heroin, their son's an alcoholic, and I look at their eyes and there's something that happens. It's stirred up and I am moved because I believe that I can do something about it. God is calling each and every one of you guys to be moved by something, compassionate about something. There's some things whenever you see the commercial and you're like, oh, yeah, that's cute. I might give one time. But then there's other times when God stirs you up until you cannot rest until you do something about it. And that is the compassion that Jesus wants us to lead with. Compassion means this, concern for the suffering or the misfortune of others. It's the idea. Remember when Jesus, he goes up to the lady on the well, and I said, you got to find a need and fill it, find a hurt and heal it. It's not original. I, I heard this saying, but I, I believe it's so true. But how do you find a need and fill it, find a hurt and heal it? It's the last part. Put yourself in their shoes. You got to put yourself in their shoes. To have compassion, you have to for just a moment. Because I promise you this, nobody wakes up just wanting to be a drug addict. Nobody wakes up and says, you know what, I want to become an alcoholic and ruin every relationship around me. Have you ever heard the, the saying or when people tell them, you, you love drugs more than you love your kids. You love alcohol more than you love our marriage. And it looks like it's true, but how many people know that's not true? It's not true. Nobody wakes up and says, I want to become bound by the enemy, become bound by a substance until I ruin every single thing around me. No, what the truth is, is that they love that person. They are caught up. And the enemy's trap. And if we can't for one moment put ourselves in their shoes, we can never lead like Jesus. And maybe that's why Jesus went through all the pain that he went through so he could relate and get on their level. Lashes on their back, pain in the garden, nailed to a cross so he could be able to relate to a person like you and I, it's, it's compassion. It's, it's, I sometimes I believe whenever we lead with compassion, it's the thing that fuels us. On the inside of us, I, w I woke up at 3 in the morning on Wednesday morning to start writing my sermon. And I usually like to be done by Thursday. It was Wednesday morning, and I had absolutely nothing. I got up at 3 o'clock, and I got up, and I just started praying. I was like, God, give me a word. I don't want to just preach anything. I, I need a word from you. This is our vision series and absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. And my mind was racing. Have, have you ever had that happen where you're supposed to focus on something, but your mind is racing on everything else? And you don't get that everything else done or the thing that you're supposed to be focusing on. 
nothing happens, and I'm getting more and more anxiety, and the more anxiety that I get, the less creativity that I have, and I'm supposed to go teach the men's home because it's Wednesday morning, and I was about to call them and say, hey, you know what, I'm going to teach tomorrow. Pastor Z could teach another day because he usually teaches on, on Thursday. I was one phone call away because I didn't have a word, and I was a problem, one person having a problem, and I, I, God, I was like, God, I don't have a word. I'm one person. And then God just, he stopped me for the moment. There's 60 guys with a problem who need a word. You're one person with a problem. There's 60 guys with a problem. Maybe if you go give them a word, I'll give you the word. And so I was like, I'm not going to get anything anyways, I shut the iPad and I show up and I'm teaching right, right here. We have this whole thing filled out with the guys on Wednesday morning. And I was getting anxiety a little bit because I wanted to hurry up and get back to the sermon because when I teach, it's usually like two, two and a half hours. And I'm sitting here and I'm telling them this story that I didn't get a sermon, but I feel like I'm supposed to come pour out. I'm supposed to, uh, uh, to give y'all a word. And maybe because of that, God's going to give me a word and fill me up. And then we started to use these words and talk about fill me up or or. More, I want more of you, God. Have you ever thought about the cliches that we say in church? Like, God, we invite you in this place. And we really don't think about what we just said. God, since you are not everywhere at all times, we invite you into this place. <laughs> like, how can you invite God <laughs> into a place that he was there before it ever existed. I get it, though. I get it. What are we really saying? God, we want to see you move in this place. We want to see manifestations of your spirit. We want miracles in this place. That's what we're saying, God. We invite you, but sometimes we say things just because we say them because we heard it in church one time. And one of the, one of the guys in the home, he came from, I think it was New York. He said he used to be a worship leader, and he was like, oh, my God, because I used to say stuff like that. And he goes, I was a worship leader. And he goes, um, he said, I used to tell people our job as a worship leader is to usher in the presence of God. And just hearing you were like, <laughs> start laughing. <laughs> it sounds cool. I get it. But when you think about it, the ushers are back there. And guess what? If you're new here and you don't know where to go, the ushers are going to tell you where to sit down. The ushers are going to tell you where to go because you don't know where to go. Holy Spirit, since you don't know where to go, I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you where to go. It really doesn't make sense, though, right? But I get it. Don't stop praying those prayers. But then it gets me to this point right here. I was trying to figure out where was I going with this. <laughs> Just rabbit trailing, guys. It's all right. I was asking God for more of him. Fill me up. I want more of you. Fill me up. There's nothing wrong with that. How many people agree? How many people want more of God? How many people want to be filled up with God? But I was telling people, sometimes we have to think about what we're saying when we pray that. Think about it for just one second. You're asking for more of God. Can he give you more than what he already is? And when he saved you and he stepped into your life, he gave you the fullness of who he is. You will have as much God as you will ever need in your entire life. But maybe we should pray prayers like John the Baptist. God, let me decrease so you can increase and maybe we could stop praying prayers because in our mindset uh, us kind of being greedy with it God give me more God give me more how about God allow me to be less and then we say God fill me up God fill me up God fill me up the reason why I'm saying this is because how many people have ever said God fill me up and you don't feel filled up don't lie to me <laughs> not up here screaming for nothing <laughs> We say, God, fill me up. God, I want more of you. God, fill me up. But then I started thinking about it. I don't have a word Wednesday morning, and I'm saying, God, fill me up. And then he's like, how can you ask me to fill you up when you're still full of yourself? How can we ask God to fill us up when we are filled with ourself? Maybe the prayer should be this. God, pour me out. God, pour me out. God, pour me out. God, let me decrease so you can increase. God, pour me out. God, pour me out. Maybe if we just stop 
and turn it instead of asking for more. Because we're a generation that wants more and more and more and more. God, fill me up. God, give me more. God, fill me up. God, give me more. God, let me decrease. Let my desires decrease so yours will increase. God, not my will, but your will be done. No matter what it looks like, I want to be faithful to whatever you call me to do. God, pour me out so I can get something fresh. And I believe whenever we start to lead in that manner, in that capacity, with compassion for somebody else, God, give me an opportunity to pour myself out. If you want something more, I believe you need to pour out everything you have unto the Lord for somebody else. It says, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved. His insides were moved. He could feel it on the inside of him with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. This is an Old Testament uh, reference. Jesus wasn't just saying it just to say it. What was actually happening in the book of Numbers, whenever Moses, he could not get the people into the promised land. He got them out of Egypt, but he couldn't get them into the promised land. He's passing the torch. He's passing the mantle on to Joshua. And Joshua is an Old Testament type or foreshadowing of Jesus. What Moses couldn't do, Joshua could do. You got him out of Egypt, but you couldn't get him into the promised land. How many people know that God doesn't just want you saved. He wants you set free. And Jesus is coming and saying, I am not the one, I'm not going to just save you, but I'm going to set you free because we have too many Christians who are saved and still bound. When God steps in, he wants to step in all the way. The one who the son sets free is free indeed. In Matthew 9, 37 and 38, it says, the word of the Lord reads, then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray. Everybody say pray. We cannot overemphasize the importance of all of you guys coming to agreement for the vision of our church for this one right here. That we would pray the Lord to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Here Jesus, he shifts his metaphor from the flock to the field. And just like there is ripe grain ready to be plucked out of the field and brought into the storehouse, there are souls ready to be plucked out of this world and brought into the kingdom of God. There is endless amounts of souls but yet so few soul winners willing to reach out to somebody in need. And you know what I learned? Sometimes it's easier to reach out to a stranger than it is to minister to a family member. You ever experienced that? You're like, but they're knuckleheads because they're just like you. I think sometimes we get into this rhythm and this habit that I would rather pray for somebody, speak life into somebody, somebody I don't even know. As much as a family member that I know that doesn't know the Lord. It's like winning the whole entire world but not our neighborhood. It's winning our community and we didn't win our family. Because sometimes God uses us to reach out in the most unlikely places, right? I led a person to the Lord. I was in a, I was in a Burger King bathroom out of all places. And I don't know how this happened. But I'm washing my, no, I wasn't washing my hands yet. I was about to. And I was started up a conversation with this guy, and I don't know how it happened, but he ended up talking about the problems that he was going through, the issues. But how many people know that when you got the answer, you need to give it? And I said, bro, there's one way out of this. Everything that you're going through right now, I promise you, Jesus can fix all that. He's like, what do I need to do about it? I said, all you have to do is believe in the Lord, trust in him. You will be saved today. Your whole life will change. And I said, I'm about to pray for you. I'm about to lead you to the Lord. But first, we both need to wash our hands. <laughs> the Bible says have a pure heart and clean hands. So, <laughs> And I led this dude, this guy, this gentleman to the Lord in a Burger King bathroom. It sounds awesome. You're like, wow, what a man of God, Pastor. You are so incredible. Well, I got a back door with one that didn't work so well. I had a friend of the family who lived that lifestyle that we all used to live to in my family. And uh, he was my brother's best friend, knew me since I was a baby. And one day he reaches out to me on Facebook and he was like, man, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of the, the man that you've become. I wanna change my ways too. And I'm like, hey bro, that's awesome. Leave it at that. 
And then he writes me back and he says, when you get some time, can you give me a call? I want to learn more about God. Changed my life also. I didn't respond. I was like, yeah, cool, whatever. I will. That's what I do. About a week later, I get a text message from my sister. She's like, brother, she works on the fourth floor at the bank. And she sends me a picture of the ground and there's ambulances out there. And she said, a man just fell from the fourth story of the bank. They were working on the roof. And he fell down and died right by my window. And I was like, oh, wow, that's horrible. She goes, brother, it was Gus. That was my friend. And my heart just drops. I'm like, what? And then I remembered he reached out to me, and I opened up my Facebook messenger. Hey, my bro, this is my number. Give me a call when you get a chance. I want to know more about God. I would go out of my way to lead somebody to the Lord in a Burger King bathroom. And yet a family member didn't take it that serious. Now, I'm not saying I'm purely responsible for that. Because I believe that God could win a soul with or without me. But I believe that the lesson was for me to take every soul as important as somebody you know or somebody you don't know. Because we have no clue if that's going to be the last time that they will ever ever have an opportunity. And church, let me tell you something. That's not my job. That's our job. Because I have the microphone, and this is the calling of God on my life. It doesn't mean that you are not called to reach the lost, to make disciples, and to lead the world in your own way. You know the craziest thing in the world, right after the first service, I wasn't going to say my friend's name just because for some reason, I wasn't even going to tell this story because I started rabbit trailing and I got too far and I didn't want to. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to tell this story. I paused for just a moment in the first service. And I went ahead and said the, the, the story about my friend. And then I said his name. And then outside, this man comes up to me and he goes, he's crying. He's like, I just want to thank you. He goes, I'm Gus's father-in-law. He said, we started coming to the church a few weeks back. It really felt like the Lord told us to come here. And I tell them the same thing. I'm sorry for your loss. And I'm not taking it personally responsible. I'm just, I share that failure with you. I feel like it was a failure. But I share that, the transparency or the vulnerability or whatever you want to call it. It don't really matter. It's to give you a glance, a glimpse into my life so you can stir up on the inside of you. If somebody wants to know about Jesus, they got the right person. If somebody needs to know about the Lord, I'm going to talk to them about the Lord. Because the same God that saved you can save them. And I don't want God to have to skip past me and go to somebody else to use him, to be used by him. Get ready to close. And so we, we learn to lead ourselves. We learn to lead with compassion. And the last one is this. I believe when we do that, then and only then can we lead the way. Then and only then can we truly lead the way. Matthew 5, 16, it says this. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That's why we have the torch. That's why we want to light the way. And the Bible says to shine for God. How many people know that God wants you to shine? God wants you to shine. And some people are like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to shine. No, whenever you shine for God, whenever somebody sees your life, they see your life and they know that nobody could do that other than God. Whenever they see your life, there's no way in the world that she could become what she is today with the problems that she used to struggle with. Only God could have done something like that. There's no way God could have taken a drug addict and made a pastor out of him. Only God can get the credit for that. That's why the Bible says to let your light shine before others. That they would see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I believe the best way to lead is to lead by example. The best way to teach somebody is to show somebody. It's better to show somebody where to go instead of tell somebody where to go. Have you ever been to a, a grocery store and you ask the guy, the worker, hey, do you know where to get coffee? And he's like, yeah, you're going to go four aisles down. You're going to take a left. It's going to be on the back wall to the right. You're like, okay. But then sometimes you get that worker you're like, hey, do you know where I can get some coffee? He puts his stuff down. He goes, come on, it's this way. 
And he walks the four aisles down. He walks to the back and says, what kind do you want? I think we've all had that experience, have we not? There's a big difference from somebody who will tell you the way and somebody who will show you the way. Church, God is calling us to show people the way. There's a big difference between a travel agent and a tour guide. There's a big difference between a travel agent and a tour guide. A travel agent will sit at their desk and tell you all about the place that you're about to go. They probably never left the city, though. They got pictures of Hawaii, of Alaska, of this cruise all on their walls. And they're going to tell you that if you buy this package, then you're going to get this. And here's some gift cards or coupons. And this is what you can have whenever you get there. This is who you're going to go see. You're like, awesome. And they tell you where to go. But a tour guide is something different. A tour guide is whenever you show up and you get off the plane or you get off the bus. And there's somebody right here saying, I've been here. I've already been through this whole thing. And I'm going to show you and I'm going to tell you everything that I've experienced. I'm going to show you the way. Church, God is calling us to be a tour guide, to share your experiences and your testimonies. Maybe there's a reason why you went through what you went through. So you could tell her, sister, this is what's going to happen after the divorce. This is what's going to ha happen after the death. This is what's going to happen after the bankruptcy. Been there. I've been through it. I'm going to walk you through this too. It's a big difference. You guys tell me the reason why they respect me so much is that I don't have a lab coat telling them how to fix their life and never done it myself. But I walked this thing for 10 years of my life and now for 10 years of my life I'm on this side. But God is calling us up because we all can't go through everything and we all can't help everyone but everybody has been through something and everybody can help someone and when you bring us all together one house with one vision multiple people different backgrounds different colors we go out into this community there's somebody in this church that can help them out there there's somebody and do you know how you know it's going to be you're going to start feeling it you're going to start getting moved and then you're going to be like, you know what? I don't want to be at a church where everybody looks the same. I don't want to be at a place where everybody looks the same. That's how I know I'm at the wrong place. I want drug addicts in the church. I want prostitutes in the church. I want drug dealers in that church. I want people who've been through a divorce. There's the other side. People who cheated in the IRS. You're not excluded. Remember one time we had a men's retreat and they were, the guy, they were talking to the, uh, to the men's home and they were like, hey, we're all sinners. Y'all just got caught. He was like, y'all went to, he goes, y'all get in trouble for drugs. We get in trouble for tax evasion. I was like, you sure all right? <laughs> we have a membership class coming up uh, February 7th. And I believe that this is where after knowing the vision of our church to get plugged into something, to become something stable, something like a foundation, because it's the members that lead the way. How many people know that? It's, it's not that, oh, I got my membership. That's not what I mean. But it's the people who are plugged in and saying, this is my church. We had a $100,000 campaign called Game Changer last year. And our goal was to renovate the entire children's church, to renovate the men's home. We had like 30 guys and we said we wanted to double. We got 60 guys, mission complete. And the rest of the money was to help with the operations because we just got this church started. Or what we didn't know, we were about to get ready for COVID and God was gonna make sure that we were taken care of. But it was some selfless members who said leaders go first and we will lead the way. And this is why you guys gave your 10% in your tithe you gave your normal offering and you went above and beyond and a sacrificial giving and you gave the game, game changer for an entire year. Because you know why? Leaders go first. I do not want the people who just got to this church to be worried about giving money. We don't want your money. I want you to focus on your marriage. I want you to focus on the loss that you went through. I want you to focus on the fact that God can bring your kid back or maybe your kid's in the home. 
I don't want you to have to worry about how much money am I going to have to give. No, you know why? Because there's some people doing that for you so you don't have to. Because leaders go first. But then the tables will turn and you're saying, now it's my turn. Because there's somebody who's lost and there's somebody who's broken. And I don't want them to have to worry about giving or where they're going to have a children's church. Because today we have a children's church. Today we have a men's home that is growing. Today we have every single thing that we need. Why? Because we lead the way. Leaders go first. They lead by example. We reach the lost. We make disciples. And we're going to lead this world. This is the vision of this house. I was going to say something funny. Get with it or get with it. I'm just playing. That's who we are. I'm just playing. No, but seriously, it's a absolutely imperative that we get plugged into something. Get a foundation. Um, even though our life groups haven't been going because of COVID, this is how we run everything out of life groups. We don't believe that you can have a real discipleship, real discipleship without relationship. And we believe that our life group is the way that we do it. So we, this service, I'm, gonna, I'm about to pray, close us out. But I want you to pray this last prayer, the final prayer as we close out this series, is that God would stir something up in the inside of you. I don't care where you work, a bank, teacher, hospital, God is calling you. That's your harvest field. That's your field. We don't need more pastors behind pulpits. We need more pastors in the bank, more pastors in the school, more pastors in the hospitals. People who are willing to witness, to get outside of themselves, to be stretched and go pray for somebody even though they don't know how. I want, God, I want you to pray that prayer. Say, God, reveal to me what it is. What's my purpose? What's my calling? And even though I'm going to be afraid, I'm going to be afraid to step up, to sign a connect card, to step up and serve. Sometimes it's finances are tight, but you're like, God, I know you got me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, God. I just want to take my time on that one, God. I just pray that your flock, your people, your sheep, your children would have such a passion and a desire to build your kingdom and that they would know, God, that no matter what they've been through, the damage and the pain, it does not matter. They can still reflect your son. And so I pray for that calling. I pray for that gift, that purpose to rise up in their life, God. And just like that torch, that they would hold it high and that they would lead the way and be the person that you've